course, now I'm going to get uh, some other haters when I actually reveal that I'm part Jewish. <gasps> you didn't! Now, I don't consider myself a Jew because I, I'm not religious. I don't follow any of this stuff. It's it, it's not something I concern myself with or think about. I don't consider myself Jewish in any way. But according to, uh, basically, Jewish law, I'd be considered a Jew. And here's why. Because my mother's mother's mother was an Orthodox Jew. She had to convert to Christianity because she fell in love with my great-grandfather and his family were extremely devout Baptists and they wouldn't let my great-grandfather marry a Jew. She converted to Christianity. She passed a lot of those same traditions down and still basically raised my grandmother Jewish even though she was raised Christian also. And then my mother converted back to Judaism. I had been a couple generations back in the family. Before my mother passed away, she made this decision as an adult. After, you know, I was already grown, my mother converted to Judaism. And she was a practicing Jew for about eight years before she died. And she was very, very religious about it. It was a pretty big deal to her. And, uh, you know, enough so that, that I respected my mother's choice to do that, enough so that when she passed away, I went and took her masuza off the door, and I had put it on my front door, and I had it there for several years after she died. So I even put my mother's masuza on the front door. And they just accused me of being one, knowing full well that back in Nazi Germany, I would have been put in Auschwitz. And again, this is coming from someone who... If there is a Holocaust like there was before in the United States, I am a dead man. Yes, I am aware that a video has been made trying to assassinate my character with an interview with one of my ex-wives and everything. First of all, she called me a white supremacist. I have a Jewish mother. The last time I checked, I'm kind of out of the club there on that one. Uh, because every country in the world needs to maintain its identity. Everyone else has their own uh, national identities they can maintain. I don't have an issue with someone saying that in Europe, and I, I don't think that makes me racist. Hell, I'm, I'm half Jewish, guys. All right. My mother was a practicing Jew at the time of my death. I was not raised Jewish. I don't think of myself as Jewish. I was raised originally um, in East Texas out in the country. Uh, later moved to Houston, as a, later in my childhood, but uh, still spent a lot of time back out there. So that's not necessarily my culture, but uh, during the Holocaust, because of who my mom was, I would have gone in the ovens. So everyone who's sending me the hate mail of, of calling me an anti-Semite, there's a story. I don't hate my dead mother. I love her very, very, very much. And I love my grandmother and my great-grandmother. I love all of them very, very deeply. I do not hate them, I swear. And so, now then I'll get off <laughs> the hate mail from the other group. All right, guys, I just wanted to clarify that and make sure that this was perfectly clear. That It's not even conceivable that, that I'm an anti-Semite in light of what I just told you. So stop and think about that for a minute. And this is, again, coming from someone who knows they're dead if there's another Holocaust here. I'm dead. First of all, a lot of them see me as a pedophile and they really and truly believe I'm like a pedophile or a child molester, even though there's never been a single charge or accusation anywhere in my life of any such thing that I actually personally despise pedophiles. And the reason I despise pedophiles is because I was abused as a child. And it's ironic that some of these people have uncovered that, that there are public records I'm not going to lie, guys, there are public records and people have found them of me pressing charges against my aunt and uncle. Um, I was abused as a child and it was pretty horrific and I pressed charges and testified against them as an adult later. So it's ironic that people have singled me out for that when the reality is I really and truly hate pedophiles, all pedophiles. I have people who are gay who I consider to be family and I have family members who are gay. So to me, it's just another thing. So to me, they're just people. A lot of it seemed to be due to people not liking my thing about the Native American thing. Well, let me make something clear. I am actually documented to be part Native American, so I'm not hating Native Americans. I have a long history of hunting. I was raised as a hunter. I was taught very traditional hunting ways. I'm also part Cherokee Indian, and uh, I had to fight a lot as a kid. Little backstory there, that's one of the reasons I got into martial arts at age seven. I was uh, the white kid with a rich grandpa who talked funny because I was deaf in one ear. 
So it got me into quite a few conflicts. And I actually love Latino people. I've got Latino members in my family. I actually appreciate certain aspects of their culture. But one of the negatives of it, it's actually in a lot of ways a positive. I love how Latino culture, they're so family oriented. I think it's one of the most positive aspects of Hispanic culture. The problem is that they always have each other's back, even as children, their cousins, brothers, sisters, second cousins, they always have each other's back. And that's great and all, but as most of you know, every family has that one dumbass. That one dumbass who can't stay out of trouble, who, who can't avoid causing problems or get in trouble. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Exactly, you Hispanic guys out there, you exactly know what I'm talking about, because you got that guy and you're always like, mijo, I love you because, but you're fucking stupid. That guy. And what happens is that when you're nine years old and that guy decides to pick a fist fight with you and you beat him, you got to fight his brother next. Then you got to fight three of his cousins next. And then you got to fight his second cousin. And before long, you've had to get in fist fights with seven or eight different members of his family inside of two weeks because they all got to come and have their family members back. Jason, when you were in school, how many fist fights did you get into and how many did you see? This is seeming to happen more nowadays than it did when you were a kid. Uh, no, it's not. They, they don't have anywhere near the fist fights that I saw as a kid. When I was a kid, fist fights were every day at school. There was always somebody in a fist fight, pretty much Monday through Friday. I don't think I remember days as a kid where some kid somewhere wasn't in a fist fight out on the school ground. Happened every day. So I talked funny and uh, all of that. So I got in a lot of fist fights. Any of you Hispanic guys, you know you all have that one cousin who's a fucking idiot who just can't help but get himself in fights. And I know you guys, you look at him and you go, Mijo, I love you, but you're fucking stupid. All right, you know what I'm talking about. The problem is that Hispanic families, once you fight someone in their family when you're growing up, you gotta fight the whole family. You gotta fight all their brothers, you gotta fight all their cousins, and they all have eight cousins. How many fist fights did I get in as a kid? Probably 30, 35, something like that. So, oh gosh, somebody. I was, I was almost gonna say, my dad, but I knocked my dad out once already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Well, he knocked me out with a steel pipe once. And then we got an argument about something, and I ended up knocking him out. Actually, we were working cattle on the ranch, and we were vaccinating the cows for black light. And I'm in there pushing the cows through the chute, and he's popping them. He reached over and thought it would be funny to pop me with the, uh, the vaccination gun. Uh, so I, I won't be getting black light. But I climbed out of the chute, and you know, I came out, you know, I jumped down, I knocked it out, and, you know, which is pretty good considering my dad's a former Green Beret. That was a, a solid effort. <laughs> All right, next question How many fights have you been in? Tell us fighting stories, man. Have you been knocked the fuck out or knocked someone out? Tell us all that shit. All right, some other people already answered this question. Some other people kind of rolled their eyes at it too. Clearly this person and a lot of you do not have an uh, upbringing anything like mine. And have I been, I've been knocked out one time. My father knocked me out with a steel pipe. And I hate questions like this because to me this is, this is playground schoolyard shit. And I didn't have that sort of upbringing to even look at the schoolyard the way that other people do and a lot of young men do before they become adults. My father was, is an asshole and he was a, and I've talked about this in detail on the Ask Jason channel, my upbringing. My father was a Green Beret in Vietnam. He was a hard ass when I was growing up. He didn't teach me the same life lessons other got, people got. I wasn't taught to fist fight it as a resolution. My upbringing, and particularly with my also my grandfather being a naval officer, I was always taught to use violence as a last resort. You always try to talk your way out of a conflict because conflict and physical conflict, the intended result is generally to kill somebody. Even though I might be stronger and better trained, the fact of the matter is by engaging them in hand to hand, I'm not being efficient. I am putting myself at risk of harm. You know, guys, I'm, I'm 38 years old. A young guy who maybe been doing some weightlifting might get a lucky hit in and seriously injure or hurt me, despite the fact that I have a black belt and two styles of martial arts. Besides the fact that I'm trained in hand to hand, besides the fact that I'm a strong guy, they could get lucky and hurt me. I have a right to defend myself while minimizing harm to myself. 
And if that means that I need to empty an entire magazine into them, that is what I am going to do. They're the ones who made the choice to put me into the situation where I need to use force. And as someone who is trained in fighting and trained in tactics, I know that once I am put in a conflict, that it is in my best interest to use maximum force and neutralize the threat as efficiently and as quickly as possible with minimal risk to myself and to my loved ones. And then he tried to kiss my married friend and she pushed him away and he put her in a choker hold. So I ended up having to get in a confrontation to pull him off of her because he and I had to grapple around. I specifically went completely out of my way to avoid punching this guy or hitting him and using submission holds. I ended up getting my arm bit. And when he bit my arm, I hooked my fingers in his cheek which will generally paralyze somebody. You can hook them like a fish. And I put him chest down on the floor and I held him there. At that point, I was trying to keep calm. I didn't realize how much pain I had put the guy in with that hole because it hurts quite a bit. And I told him, if you're going to be cool, I will let you up. And he said he'd be cool. Just please let him go. When I let him up, he came up and he caught me with a left and he got me really, really good. And by that same token, younger guys don't seem to realize if you walk up to someone who has that mentality, which is again, the mature adult mentality, and you make a fist and you threaten to hit them, they're not gonna stand there and trade blows with you. If they have a gun or a knife on them, they're probably gonna pull it and use it on you. That's how you get stabbed or shot in the adult world. If there's a chair nearby or a piece of wood or a steel pipe or anything, they're probably gonna grab that and knock the fuck out of you with it. Because I have seen this happen at least a dozen times in my life. That's what happens. They, they don't stand there and fist fight you. They find something to hit you. And in the worst case, if you do end up whooping their ass in a fight, you got to do enough damage that they can't immediately retaliate. Because a lot of grown, mature adults, they take an ass whooping in a fight. They're going to go off and get a gun and they're going to come back and find you an hour later and shoot you. And why am I saying that? Because it happens every single day as you mature into an adult you, you need to understand that when you get in fist fights they are life and death there's a real possibility that when you do get into a physical confrontation with adults that you are going to die or there's a possibility that you're going to have to kill that person my dad is kind of psycho uh ex green beret from vietnam very successful businessman my father is pretty much a sociopath. I still love him, but it, it's the truth. Even my sister will admit the same. He's a self-made millionaire now, self-made multimillionaire. Now granted, he doesn't give anybody any of his money. He doesn't even have me in his will, but he is also a ex Green Beret and Vietnam veteran. Now growing up, the extent of my life lesson from my father consisted of, from childhood, teaching me everything that he learned in the Green Berets and in Vietnam. Those were pretty much my childhood lessons from my father. He never taught me anything about how to be a man, never taught me any life lessons. He did teach me how to work on race cars. He never told me he loved me, never gave me a hug, never once in my life told me he was proud of me. When I asked my father about some of this later as an adult, his response was, I provided for you growing up, I taught you how to be a survivor, a warrior, and a fucking killer. What more does a man need in life? That's everything you need to know. My father had been a Green Beret, and, and the other one, the grandfather, was my maternal grandfather. My father obviously had a lot of firearms. He, again, was a Green Beret in Vietnam. And my father had his own views of what he thought I should do with my career. So my father trained me to do a lot of things at a young age. And a lot of that led to a lot of the other stuff I don't talk about. My father got me involved in those things, whether I wanted to or not. Which ended up with me doing some contract work later as an adult. I compromised my own morals and went and did work that I wasn't totally morally always comfortable with. Seeking the approval of a father who never told me that he loved me or gave me a hug my whole life. That's kind of sad in a way. But that's not something I brag about or I'm proud of. To me, in a way, I see that as a sign of weakness, that every time I tried to stand up to my own father, he told me quit being a little pussy and be a goddamn warrior and pull myself up by the bootstraps. That no son of his was going to be a pussy, and if I was going to be a pussy, I wasn't his son. That I needed a warrior the fuck up. But my father also was the type who he threw me in a swimming pool in the deep end of a pool and screamed sink or swim when I was a kid. And when he saw me sick in bed, 
he came to visit me and keep in mind he didn't help me out this is not uh, someone who gave me money my father's worth millions he didn't give me a penny he looked at me when I was sick and told me um, basically that I needed to warrior the fuck up and pull myself up by the goddamn bootstraps and then you know he kind of left and you've got to remember my father also went into the Green Berets spent the last two years of the war in Vietnam as a Green Beret in Special Forces. I was always taught from a young age that when you enter into any sort of physical conflict, you end your opponent. You make sure that they can never inflict harm on you again, and preferably you do it before they can inflict any harm. You totally neutralize the threat. You overwhelm them with extreme violence. You hold nothing in reserve. If they pull a knife, you pull a gun. They pull a gun, you shoot a missile before they can strike. As soon as the threat becomes a known, immediate, you strike hard with everything you have. My father's mentality ingrained in me at a young age. That's how my dad thinks. He was, again, a Green Beret veteran. Now he's in business. He applies that same model to his business models. A very successful businessman, multimillionaire. Every one of my family members from both sides of my family, all the men from that generation, were World War II survivors. Every single one of them. All of my great uncles, both of my grandfathers, and I remember hearing the stories from these men, including Uncle Hardy, who was a Pearl Harbor survivor. I had a grandfather who fought at D-Day. He came over here through England, stormed the shores at Normandy, fought at D-Day. Because I had one grandfather who was in the Navy fighting against the Japanese during World War II, and my other grandfather was at D-Day. As an American, he came across, was stationed in England and came across in the offensive and he survived D-Day and watched his brothers get blown apart on the beach. He never talked about it because of the PTSD. He never once told a story about it, but he saw it. He was there. He fought all the way to the end and helped liberate the camps at the end all the way in Germany and the mainland. My father's father was the children of Czechoslovakian immigrants. He was a father of seven children. He ran a farm. He ran a ranch raised free-range cattle, worked at a factory on top of that, had a big cornfield, so he grew corn, but he was also involved in illicit business and things in order to make sure that he had enough for his family to get by and to continue to expand their empire. The guy made moonshine with his corn. He grew marijuana in a little back corner of his cornfield that some of us kind of knew about. He didn't talk about it much. He didn't even smoke it, but he grew it and sold it back there because he had the land to do so. My grandfather was a very generous man. He was a very good man. Um, you know, he was noted for being a philanthropist and giving to charities and, um, you know, being a world traveler and a businessman. And, uh, you know, I mean, he was, he was noted for those things. Person, my dad really went out of his way for me to not be a big floppy pussy because, and he still sees me that way, which is <laughs> really kind of funny. But my dad is really probably the scariest person I know. And without going into his full life story, my dad was a Green Beret at Vietnam. He later worked for, and I'm not going to say what agency, he later worked for the intelligence community. This is stuff that people can pull up on background checks, and people have done background checks on my dad related because of all the lawsuits and shit I've been through. And then my dad has worked in upper management for Cameron International, and he now owns his own company in the hydrogen and natural gas industry. My father is, uh, again, because of his special forces training and later his work in the intelligence community, my dad is a very interesting person, and he really went through a lot of trouble to make me tougher and harder and for me to basically a, a be a killer that he went through a lot of efforts to try to do that for me, which again, my father being who he was, it led to some interesting career opportunities later in life. But because of those life experiences, in a way, I'm really a damaged person in a lot of ways. And yes, I did crack under the PTSD from some of the work I did later, which again, I can't discuss with you guys. I got to see some interesting things in life, but if I talk about it, I'll spend the rest of my life in prison. But it gave me an interesting perspective on life. And yeah, I am a very damaged person as a result of that. I don't have this, I don't hold human life in the same value that a lot of people do. It doesn't have a whole lot of meaning to me. Uh, and a lot of people kind of get that impression. Who meet me, particularly veterans and things, definitely pick up my thousand yard stare and stuff. So I have that certain intimidation. My father is a multimillionaire. There is confirmation that my father was special forces. Well, these people decided in an interview to contact my father under false pretenses. Which, of course, I don't think they realize when doing that calling uh, pertaining to be a national of a foreign government 
to call my multi-millionaire ex-special forces father and talk about mercenary work. That's some ballsy shit right there. Obviously, he went on high alert, did a distract and denial method and a lot of things and just kind of threw stuff out there because he was trying to figure out exactly what's going on when someone with a foreign accent claiming to be a member of a foreign government is contacting him about mercenary work <laughs> over his private cell phone. Um, that's some ballsy shit. Which, by the way, he has all your details now. Well, Jerry, let me uh, explain to you how that works. What's my last name? Blaha? You know, you know many Blahas? Know my family? Any of them? Well, you probably don't want to reach your hand too far into a Blaha's pocket, because if you do, you might draw back a stump. And uh, I do have a bit of experience in accounts receivable. And I don't really, we're not talking about the law or courts. You might want to be careful how far you stick your hand in my pocket, son. Because what goes in my pocket stays in there, and that includes your hand. So think about it. I earned black belts in two different styles of martial arts with it. I did bodybuilding. I did powerlifting. I was able to function extremely well. I started training at 19. I, well, not training, but actually lifting weight. I had been a martial artist and a distance runner before that. And when I was 19, I was 270 pounds. Well, guess what I did? I saw my family history. I saw my father had had his first heart attack when he was 32. I got tired of looking down and having to lift my belly up to see my own penis. And I got tired of feeling like shit. So I took up distance running. Do you think I liked running? No, I didn't know what else to do to get into shape, so I just started running every day until I got to where I could run 10 miles. I'm 37 now. I started my original weight loss journey when I was 19, and it ended after I was well over 20. And, and because I started out fat, and I gained something like 90 pounds my first year after I graduated high school. I started running every day. I did a few body weight exercises, but I initially started with just running and that first day, it was in the middle of a Texas summer. I ran every day as far as I could until I pretty much was just my size hurt and I couldn't run any further. And I eventually got up to where I could run 10 miles. I didn't really start lifting weights till I was around 19. And I was actually a distance runner at the time and then switched over and started lifting weights. Well, I think I am more suited to wear a Batman shirt than any of those guys. I have black belts in more than one style of martial arts. Batman was a martial artist. I get asked this a lot. People always say, oh, you've mentioned you have a martial arts background. Why don't you talk about the details? Will you please talk about the details? And it's just like a lot of my other past. The answer is not just no, but hell no. And my reason being just because of the nature of my own past, my own background, I tend to think very tactically. And to me, I see no advantage whatsoever since I'm not an instructor. I don't instruct martial arts at all, never have, never will. There is no reason for me to ever go into detail on that stuff. And accordingly, anytime I give out to people out there, I'm a person who gets continual death threats because of my controversial videos. And I do have to think towards the future and towards self-defense. I don't ever let people know publicly what the full extent of my operational capacity is, what the extent of any training I have is, and my fighting ability, because that's giving out free intel that gives people a possible advantage if they do want to attack me. I would much rather have people have no idea at all what my training is and what I'm capable of, and that puts me back in an advantage again in any sort of confrontation. So no, I'm not going to discuss what styles of martial arts I've studied or what sort of or training or anything that I have. It puts me at a disadvantage to do so. So I had to learn how to fight as a kid. I was in martial arts. I took karate first and I went to taekwondo. I started uh, karate when I was seven years old. But uh, as far as martial arts go, I started martial arts when I was seven. Through my teenage years, uh, I did earn the people have asked me what styles, I'm only going to cover one style that I've learned. I got my first degree black belt in American Taekwondo when I was 17. And I think I started studying that when I was around eight years old. I started with karate and switched to Taekwondo because there was a good little Taekwondo uh, instructor really near me. So I started under him and then when we moved, I had to change instructors. Bruce Lee was an extreme individual. I do know someone who knew him personally. Not going to get into all that. Uh, I know someone who trained under him for a little while, a member of my family. You know, I am a trained martial artist. I do have a fighting background. Uh, and 
and my ex-wife, you know, for a while, when our things were starting to go bad, she had become quite an alcoholic, and she would get into fistfights with me, and I would just stand there and block her. Until she got tired or until she said, oh, it hurt because she, you know, tried to hit me and I just, you know, I ended up blocking it and it ended up hurting her hand on my, you know, my forearm. And, uh, cause I was a pretty big guy back then still. I mean, I was still benching over 400 pounds at that time. <laughs> and so, you know, she's throwing punches and stuff at me and trying to hit me and I just block her, you know, until she get tired. <laughs>